Welcome to the third topic in this session, and in today's topic, we'll be looking at accrual accounting, adjusting and closing entries. Uh, just a quick overview of where we're going to be going. Um, so we're going to be first looking at profit and how it's measured and reported under accrual and cash accounting. Um, we'll then turn to the four major circumstances in which adjusting journal entries are required. Uh, once we've done that, we'll actually you know, record and post those, those adjusting journal entries and work through uh, the comprehensive example provided to create an adjusted trial balance and then the financial statements um, off the back of that. Finally, once we've done that, we'll look at what the closing process is, why we need to do it, and then to prepare the closing entries. So a bit of a recap. Um, so the last, uh, the previous video um, on the previous sort of topic, we looked at the first few um, sort of sections. We looked at just the basic journal entries for economic events. We then posted those to the T accounts. We prepared a trial balance. And once you've actually done that, you can create the financial statements, although they won't necessarily be a true reflection of what's going on in, in the entity because they will have missed out on the adjusting entries. And that's what we pick up in this particular topic. We'll look at the adjusting entries, We'll prepare and adjust the trial balance. We'll finish off the financial statements. We'll close things out and just wrap up with a post-closing trial balance. So turning to the first objective, accrual versus cash accounting, the really big difference between the two of these um, is very much around the timing of when revenues and expenses are recorded. So from an accrual perspective, revenue and expense recognition really turn on when an event happens. So for revenue, it's when the revenue has been earned. So that's when the good has been sold or when the service has been provided. Expenses, on the other hand, um, are when the expense or you know, whatever it happens to be, whether it be wages, um, advertising expense, R&D, um, you know, whatever it happens to be, when that particular item is used, not necessarily paid for. Cash, on the other hand, is a much simpler proposition to work with. Um, so revenue is just simply when the entity receives cash. Uh, and for expense, it's just simply when the entity pays cash. Um, obviously, a lot simpler to, to work with because you're just looking at when um, cash moves in or out, but doesn't necessarily give a true reflection of what's going on within the entity itself. Um, Large and publicly listed companies are required to use accrual accounting. Um, smaller companies um, are allowed to use cash accounting. And often this really has to do with the types of stakeholders that are interested in these particular entities or companies and what the purposes of them having access to these financial statements are. So this is just a, the recap from um, the previous week of uh, or the previous topic about the steps in the accounting cycle. Now, the previous topic, we went through steps one, two, and three, and in a way, we sort of jumped into step five um, when we prepared some financial statements. Uh, where we get it, where we get at today, or in this topic, is we'll look at step four, the adjusting entries uh, to begin with. So I'm gonna work on the basis that you're comfortable with uh, what gets debited and what gets credited and what goes up and down when you know, for different types of accounts. Now, the reason why we have adjusting entries is not, well, I suppose transactions um, aren't necessarily recorded as, as they happen. Um, they are recorded when something significant happens. And a good example of this is when employees work for a business. Um, so, you know, myself and, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of workplaces, you know, employees in workplaces in Australia, we get paid every fortnight. Um, in some workplaces in some countries, that may be every month um, or potentially every week. It just, you know, depends on the business. But for my particular, you know, university, they would only record an expense, when, you know, usually when they pay me. Um, so every two weeks when, you know, a certain amount of cash has moved across, um, they will debit wages or salary expense and they will credit cash um, you know, and that's obviously a bit of a simplification because we're not dealing with sort of tax effects and superannuation and so on 
But if you think about it, they could make that somewhat more granular. They could have a recording, not just every fortnight, they could have a recording every week or even every day. And if you really wanted to get down to it, they could have a transaction getting recorded every hour or every minute that I work. Um, but it would be a complete waste of time for them to do that. Um, so, you know, as we point out in, in that second bullet point there, it's really only when something significant happens where an entry gets made. But it causes a little bit of a problem at the end of the year because sometimes things have happened where that significant event hasn't taken place, but yet the company or the entity does need to reflect that these events have occurred and wages between the last pay period and the end of the financial year is, is one example of that, which, which we'll see um, quite shortly, but there are others. And so the four main circumstances where we're looking at in relation to adjusting entries really turn on when there is a separation between when the expense or the revenue is recognized and when the cash moves. So the first instance is deferred or unearned revenue. Um, and this is when cash was received prior to the revenue being earned. Accrued revenue, on the other hand, is when the revenue is earned prior to the cash being received. Prepaid or deferred expenses are when cash is paid uh, before the expense is incurred. And accrued expenses are when the expense is incurred before cash is paid. Now, what's important with all of these and, and, and why they end up being adjusting entries is those revenues or expenses have not yet been recorded. Um, and if we don't make the adjustment for them, that will mean that the accounts are misstated because revenue won't be at the level where it should have been and expenses won't be at the level where it should have been. So let's dive right into them and see what we have to do. So the first is deferred revenue. And this is when a company receives cash before it provides a good or service. And this happens in many, many situations. Um, a really good example of that, of which I think everyone has had um, you know, experience with this, is when you buy a ticket um, you know, for an airline. Um, you, you know, I can't think of an example where I've bought a ticket or paid for a ticket after I've flown. You always pay the airline before you fly. Um, and that's from the airline's perspective, they have cash, but they have not provided the service to us yet. Other examples may be um, sort of annual subscriptions to things, or it be magazines. Um, it could be online services, things like Dropbox, um, where the service isn't necessarily paid for. You know, the annual service is paid, is purchased sometime between the financial year ends. Um, so in this case, the service, I mean, a number of people have purchased a service one month prior to the end of the financial year. So in this case, they've received $1,200 for 20 subscriptions um, and the financial year ends at the end of the month. The original entry, and this is recorded, would be debit cash one, um, 1,200, credit on end revenue 1,200. The adjusting entry, which needs to be made at the end of the month is to reflect that some of that revenue has now been earned. They've provided one of the magazines um, in the subscription. So the liability that was originally recorded gets reduced and they get to record revenue. And the 100 is just, you know, one twelfth of the $1,200 received. The next example is accrued revenue. And this is when a company earns the revenue before it receives cash. Um, Lots of consulting type work or, you know, if you're professional services, the work often, you know, if not in full or at least in part is um, performed prior to cash being received. Um, and in, in, in this example, we have an accounting firm providing tax advice for a client. Um, they complete $1,000 worth of work on the 23rd of September. Uh, they bill the client um, or they send the bill to the client on the 2nd of October payment was received on the 23rd of October and the firm's year end, um, this ends on September 30. So this is in between when the work is done and the bill is sent. 
Now this means that there needs to be an adjusting entry for the 30th of September because if they wait until when the bill is sent out, that revenue would be recorded in the following year. Um, but the work was actually performed um, in the first year, you know, in this example. So that revenue needs to be recorded in in that year, um, which ends 30 September. So they need to debit accounts receivable receivable to reflect that $1,000 is owed to them, and they need to credit revenue to reflect that they have performed that work and they can record um, revenue to go in their profit and loss statement. The third example, um, we're now moving into expenses, is deferred expenses. And this is when a company pays for a resource before it uses or consumes it. Things like liability, oh, not liability, sorry, things like um, insurance, uh, rent oftentimes is paid beforehand. Um, you can think of a range of different things where something is purchased and then used up later. So in this case, the, the policy was purchased and began on March the 1st, and it cost $36,000. Uh, the company's financial year end is March 31. So in one month, well, at the end of the month, so it's been that 12 months, one month has been used of it. The original entry will be debit prepaid insurance, 36,000, credit cash, 36,000 to reflect the purchase of the insurance policy. The adjustment at the end of the month would be debit insurance expense, 3,000, credit prepaid insurance, 3,000. Um, so this is one twelfth of the $36,000 that they paid. And this entry effectively reduces um, the prepaid insurance asset, so the credit prepaid insurance, and reflects you know, one twelfth of the usage as an expense, because that's what an expense is. It's recognizing or it shows that usage um, of, you know, in this case, usage of a, a of an economic resource. And finally, accrued expenses. So when a company when a company incurs an expense and pays for it later, uh, a company has a number of employees, and and this reflects um, the example I mentioned earlier on about wages. Is that often well, unless it's very coincidental often the pay period won't line up exactly with the end of the financial year, which means there are going to oftentimes be a situation where employees have worked for a few days between their last pay period and then when the year ends. Um, so the company needs to reflect that expense and it also needs to reflect a liability to indicate that they do owe these employees wages. In this case, um, the employees were paid on on June 28, and the financial year ends a couple of days later. The adjusting entry which would be required is debit wages expense, credit wages payable, so recording the expense and the liability, and there have been three days um, that have been unpaid. The Wednesday on the 28th, the Thursday the 29th, and then the Friday the 30th. Um, so that's $3,000. And those are the four adjusting entries. A couple of key points uh, before we go and have a look at the, uh, the comprehensive example is that adjusting entries never involve cash. Um, if you find yourself thinking about using cash as a debit or a credit in the situation, just don't. Um, if there was a cash movement, there would be an actual entry, you know, just a normal um, journal entry taking place. Uh, they will always involve one account from the statement of financial position, so an asset or a liability, and one account from the statement of profit or loss, so the revenues or expenses. So what we have here is a continuation of the example from before. Um, so to do this properly, we have to assume we have the we have the um, the trial balance or the unadjusted trial balance uh, from the previous from the previous topic. Um, so if you need to go and double check that, uh, please go and do that. Uh, so the additional pieces of information that we have here is that um, on May 31, Circle Films filmed the wedding anniversary, um, and that was based on a $2,000 $2, deposit that had, that had already been paid. Uh, 
Uh, so they already have received that and now they, now they have actually filmed that wedding. On May 31, Circle Films filmed the first night of a two-night local play. The second night will be filmed uh, the following day on June the 1st. And at that time, Circle Films will build a customer. Uh, Circle Films will be paid $1,500 per night. So in this case, uh, at the end, of, the end of May, they have performed part of that service. Um, and there has been no bill sent to the customer. But you know, they have done the service and they would be owed for that um, for that being performed. So they have done $1,500 worth of work. After a physical count, Circle Films determined it had $650 of supplies left. Um, that on its own is not that useful. We'll need to know how many supplies they started with. Uh, it accrues the interest on the note payable. Uh, it's a $9,000 note payable and it's 6% per annum for one month. Um, if we don't indicate um, a time period for interest rates, uh, just assume it's always per annum. And finally, Circle Films estimates that depreciation for May on its three cameras total $600. And what we need to do is the adjusting entries, the adjusted trial balance, uh, the, the statement of profit or loss, statement of changes in equity, and statement of financial position. And finally, prepare the closing entries. But we'll talk about um, the closing entries in a few moments' time. So the first entry uh, relates to performing the service um, where they'd already received a deposit. And in this case, um, because they'd already received a deposit, they would have unearned revenue as a liability. So we need to reduce the liability by debiting unearned revenue, $2,000, and crediting service revenue, $2,000, because they've now performed the service. In the second adjusting entry, this is when they'd performed um, the service for filming the first night of the two night play for $1,500. They have performed the service, so they get to show service revenue, um, but they have not yet received the money. Um, so they need to indicate there is an account receivable, so an asset which they debit, um, to show that they are owed that money sometime in the future. Now, with supplies expense, if we come and have a look, Supplies expense or supplies, if I can find them, started at $1,000. So that's what they had on the books, um, but they only end up with 650 left. So 1,000 less, less 650 gives us 350 used up. So we reduce supplies by 350 by crediting it, and we show an expense in relation to supplies because they've been used up of $350. In relation to the interest expense, um, the interest hasn't. The interest is just accruing. They haven't paid for anything, so we just debit interest expense. And because it is accruing but not paid for, um, we credit the liability interest payable. That the amount worked out is the nine thousand dollar liability amount multiplied by six percent multiplied by one month of the twelve months in a year gives you forty five dollars. So debit expense forty five credit payable 45. And finally, for depreciation, um, a, depreciation, a depreciation entry always looks like debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. Uh, the only issue is the amount to include. Um, and in this case, they told us that. Uh, when we go to the next topic, we'll see how to actually come up with these numbers. So in this case, it's just debit 600, credit 600. And so those are the adjusting entries. At this point, we'll now move to then putting them into the trial balance. So what we have here is a trial, or the unadjusted trial balance, um, just like what it was in the previous topic. I've added a few more lines um, or accounts to deal with the fact that we'll have some accounts, additional accounts being added in here, and I've also, you know, already included the formula to so when the adjustments get made, these get automatically adjusted. And we just be really systematic with it. So unearned revenue, debit 2000. Service revenue, credit 2000. Accounts receivable, debit 1500. Service revenue, credit 1500. I'll do 
Sus uh, supplies expense, debit 350 down here. Supplies, credit 350, this reduces, reduces supplies, so we end up with 650. Debit interest expense, 45. Credit interest payable, 45. Debit depreciation expense, 600. Credit accumulation, accumulated depreciation, 600. Uh, at that point, the adjustments balance, the adjust columns balance. Um, so assuming I've not made equal but opposing errors, everything works out at this point in time. And from that, we can go and make the financial statements. And the first one we do is a statement of profit or loss. And we take the revenue of 8500 8, and the expenses, advertising, wages, supplies, interest, depreciation. Um, I've already pre-done these um, just to save a little bit of time. But you can see service revenue, well, title block, income statement, I'll call the income statement here for the month ending, 8500 less all the expenses, total expenses of 3,245, gives you net profit of 5,255. We then have a statement of retained earnings. Um, retained earnings went zero, uh, zero. Add in profit. We then need to deduct any dividends, which we can see just down here. And that gives us 3,755. The balance sheet, or well, the statement of financial position, assets, liabilities, equity, the assets, cash, accounts receivable, supplies, equipment, and the contra asset account accumulated depreciation, 8,250, uh, 1,500, 650, 18,000, and a credit 600 gives us 8,000. 8,250, 15, 650, and a net of 17,400 for a total assets balance of 27,800. Liabilities. There are three liabilities here, unearned revenue, interest payable, note payable, but the unearned has now been earned, so it's zero. So we're just left with the interest payable and the note payable. Interest payable, note payable, 9,045. Contributed capital, 1500, oh, sorry, 15,000, I should say. Retained earnings, zero here, but retained earnings come from the statement, the closing balance of the statement of retained earnings to give you total equity of 18,755, total liabilities and equity of 27,800, and they balance. And that's creating the financial statements, which have now been adjusted to reflect. Uh, the proper situation in relation to the revenues and expenses which have been earned and incurred, as well as any assets or liabilities um, which should properly, properly sit on the balance sheet. Once we have done the financial statements, which we've just done, uh, the final things we need to do are the closing entries and to you know, get a post-close trial balance. So the closing entries, the reason we do them and what they are, the purpose of closing entries is to reduce each revenue expense and dividend account to zero for the start of the next period. Um, before we get to the how, even though I've just brought it up, the reason why we do this is because you can't, because the statement of financial performance, um, you know, revenues minus expenses gives you profit. This is the statement where we're getting information to compare, you know, that entity's performance year on year, as well as compare that entity's entity's performance against other entities, um, which means it has to start clean at zero uh, for the start of next year. There can't already be existing revenues or expenses in it. Otherwise, that will lead to massive misinterpretations of the performance of the entity. Um, the best way to think about it is, or at least best way I think about it, is to think about what the score, the score line should be when a football match begins. Um, if you're thinking a football match, um, 
you know, the start of 90 minutes, it should be nil all because we know who the best team is at the end of that football match by whoever has the most goals scored. Or if it's rugby at the end of 80 minutes, whoever has the most points. If someone starts on a non-zero scoreline, then we can't really use the ending score as any real indication of how they performed within that 80-minute period. So we're only dealing with these temporary accounts of revenues, expenses, and dividends. We don't touch assets or liabilities um, or all the equity accounts other than retained earnings um, because these accounts will keep building. It's kind of like your think about your bank account um, on the 1st of July, although given most of you probably, most of you aren't accountants, say the 1st of January. 1st of January, your account balance doesn't just reset to zero, although it sort of depends on what you did on December 31st. Um, it is just rolls over from, the, from December 31 and keeps sort of building or growing throughout the year. So we don't close down assets, liabilities, or the equity accounts. What we're doing is getting rid of revenues, expenses, and dividends. And as we can see with the entries at the bottom here, we're basically putting them into retained earnings. We debit revenues because they normally have a credit balance. And by debiting them, we get rid of them. Same idea with expenses, normally a debit balance, but we're crediting them here. And dividends also normally have a debit balance. So if we come back to this example, we've got the trial balance, but now we've got the adjusted trial balance on the left-hand side. And first of all, we need to get rid of the revenue. And to do that, we debit service revenue, 8,500, credit retained earnings, 8,500. So we debit this. We can see that gets rid of it and retained earnings 8500 and that's effectively put the service revenue into retained earnings we then do the same with all the expenses these all have a debit balance and we now need to credit them to get rid of them so let's go and do that so that's all happened 11745 11745 and there's one final thing to do which is to deal with the dividends down here because we need to basically move them into retained earnings and thus reduce retained earnings. We do that by crediting dividends and debiting retained earnings. 4750 debited to retained earnings ultimately and 8,500 credited. We end up with 3,755 and all of these accounts, revenues, expenses, dividends are now zeroed out. The assets on the contra asset, the liabilities and the equities all have balances in them. And that's where we want it to be. So at that point, we have now completed the closing entries and we have a post-close trial balance. And having now done that, that wraps up the accounting cycle and we're ready to go again for the start of next year. In the next topic, we'll be looking at um, a number of adjusting entries for assets. Um, so we're gonna be focusing on accounts receivable, um, specifically the, the allowance for doubtful debts, um, inventory and how to calculate cost of goods sold, and finally property plant and equipment, um, how to bring it onto the books as well as the adjustment in relation to depreciation and how to calculate it.